Right. So um, we're privileged to have Doug Newcomb with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service talking to us today on uh, creating bathymetric data for a freshwater reservoir using satellite imagery. And um, so, Doug, please take it away and look forward to what you have to say. Okay. Uh, you've probably been staring at my title slide for a few minutes, so I'll, I'll let that go. Um, the reasoning that we had for doing this bathroom modeling is that we needed to have some habitat data for uh, American eels in the Roanoke Rapids uh, basin and the reservoir itself. So we needed both the streams, uh, we needed the topographic data for the waters upstream of the dam um, to the next dam, and then the bath bathymetry of the reservoir as well. So this is, you know, the where we're at. Uh, it's Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. It's uh, below Car Lake, and um, um, then uh, the lake itself is a water uh, power generation uh, reservoir that uh, the water level fluctuates a, a, a foot or two during the day on an hourly basis. So the first thing I do when I'm looking at these areas is what does LIDAR data tell us? Well, I went and looked at the, the DEM that was available and the middle of the lake had no data in there. There was not even a, a water level indicated. And when I went to the upper ends of it, I had all these triangles going on for the water surface of the lake, which doesn't bode well for trying to do some kind of a, a, a depth analysis. So, I decided to go back and recreate the DEM for the mean values, the ground points, and fill in the water lines with shoreline values. I uh, got a link in here to a YouTube channel that I'll make this presentation available online uh, later on. And that uh, you could also look at the presentation I made earlier in the week for the method for doing that. In the event, I grabbed the LIDAR tiles associated with the 12 digit HUX for that area. Um, and then uh, I've got everything together. And I don't know why that's there. Uh, yes, uh, then I went through that process and created a flat reservoir uh, water body for that uh, lake. And then had a continuous um, topography as well. So if you look at the LIDAR data for, and then you, the derived water level of 129.39, it's right in the, the uh, for that date that the LIDAR was flown, it's in that range of the water level for the lake, according to the, the uh, data from the, the Dominion Power folks. So I did a quick hydrologic analysis. There's a beautify option, so it looks nice when it goes down the middle of the reservoir. Um, Remove the depressions for the flow accumulation, ran some flow accumulation stuff. And I used a 25 acre basin for a break for permanent water. I've got to get back with the, the folks at DEQ about what would be, be better for that area, but that's what we're at currently. These are the streamlines that I got from that uh, analysis. And then just doing a flow accumulation, cutting it down to the ones that are 25 acres or more. I've got a few things I have to tweak on that apparently, um, but I'm, I'm good ways along with that. Now that leaves the lake. So the only public data and non-public data I could find for uh, lake bathymetry were the contour lines from the old quad sheets. And only two of the quads that cover the lake had those. Um, and it gives me a normal pool elevation of 132, which really doesn't help too much. I need the elevation of the lake bottom to describe the depth of the lake at, at multiple water levels. So this is what my LIDAR data gets me down to. It's 129.39 feet. Uh, that's considerably different than what the quad sheet shows me. And then the, the problem is, you know, I could grab all the points and I actually tried doing some of this, grabbing all the points from the contours and doing some interpolation. But once you get into the middle of the lake, you're really guessing a whole lot on what's going on with the bottom. And it kind of made me uncomfortable. So I thought, well, there's technology out there for doing satellite bathymetry. Let's go check to see how that works. So what are the resources? Well, I could do Landsat. It's a 30 meter resolution, has a 16 day return interval. 
I could look at Sentinel-2, and uh, that's at a 10 meter resolution and with a five day return interval. Um, and they, for the most recent ones, they bottom of atmosphere correct those. I did, uh, we had a bunch of eel pot sample locations, the biologists going out there, GPS coordinates, depth to the nearest meter or nearest foot. Uh, as it turns out, when they were doing their, their data collection on that for the first three months, they did their depths to the nearest meter and after that to the nearest foot. Um, I wish I'd, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> uh, the software that I picked to look at was uh, Grass Eye Image Bathymetry. It's an add on that goes with Grass um, that calls R in the background. So for the satellite data, I needed to have no clouds over the reservoir. And yet also, I needed to have days when there was no turbidity in the water. That's not an easy combination in eastern North Carolina, especially when you're just downstream of a flood control dam. So I went to Sentinel-2 because it's a five-day return interval. It's public data. Anyone can, can come back and check what I did. Uh, the EOPOT did it, as I mentioned, uh, nearest meter, nearest foot. The times of the depth measurement were recorded, which was awesome on their part because at that, that way I could get the lake levels at the time of their data collection so that I could convert them to bottom elevations. And so all the points they took, I converted to uh, bottom elevations so that then I, when I did my analysis of the satellite imagery, I would be able to and get a water level for that, then I could adjust the bottom to the, to the time of the satellite imagery. So when you look at the, there are, uh, I had three points that I didn't use because I had issues in translating uh, them, but 517 of them worked out pretty well. And you can see them here where they're scattered across the lake. And I did have someone ask me at one time, why didn't you just do a surface from these points? Well, if you look at some of these areas up in here and, and yeah, the upper in the lake there, it's, there's a whole lot of empty space up here and up here there's empty space and over here there's empty space. So I kind of wanted to go ahead and just stick with what I've got. Um, so this is, uh, an image from January 26th and, you know, nice, clear, sunny day. Unfortunately, that water is too turbid to do anything with. I actually tried to process this and I just got a few spots around some of the edges. So it doesn't work out too well. I found this one on December, from December 12th, 2019. And you know, you pull this up and you just look at it as, a, as an imagery person, you're like, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so I said, okay, this is one of my images, we're good. Uh, and then I went found another one in August of 2019, and, and it's clear it doesn't look immediately like it's going to be working too good, but it's worth trying. So uh, the grass eye image bathymetry add-on, it only works in shallow water, as all of these uh, image uh, satellite bathymetry things, it's less than a 20 meter thing, um, uses the blue and green primarily, and then the red near in infrared and short infrared are try to clear up as to what's water and what's land, so to mask out just to get the water. Really great when you've got reflective bottoms. If you've got organics on the bottom, it can really mess things up. It can throw off your, your uh, depth calculation. And it calls R for a geographically weighted regression model. Uh, it has three options, fixed, adapted, and bi-square. And uh, you use the calibration points, in this case, the eel pots, to apply that to that model to correct it. And from what I saw in the literature, the ad adaptive version seems to work best for pulling out the, the most accurate uh, bathymetry. Well, there was a problem. Uh, fortunately, it's open source because there was a bug in the version that um, the, the original script was written before a change occurred in R. And when I was first running it, only the fixed model would run. And so I had to di dive into this a little bit and I found a few things in the R script that it was building on the fly that needed to be fixed. So I fixed those and I was able to edit it and I was get, get a, got it fully functional and pushed a bug report up so other people could fix it. And uh, once the bug report was up a couple of weeks later, someone went ahead and pushed it to the main uh, grass. So this is what I came up with. And you notice the lake level here in August is uh, at 130 feet, 130.6 feet. And this is the summertime one. And 
you're getting a, a general gradient that you want. You've got the deeper water near the dam and shallow water as you go up and you maintain some deepness as you go up to the next dam. But you've got a lot of area up in here, the northeast northwest corner that you've got no coverage for. And that may be due to uh, vegetation in uh, late summer, obscuring the bottom somewhat. In the December one, we didn't have that problem up in the uh, northwest corner, but we did have issues of, of gaps in the middle. And that may have been just a decaying vegetation on the bottom obscuring it there. So what do you do? Uh, and you also notice that this lake level was two feet lower than the other one. So uh, being able to adjust the, the, the depths on the fly from the, the bottom elevations worked out great from the eopods. So I had to go back and do assessments of accuracy. So I did uh, 500 points or so. Uh, I mean, I've got 520 points throughout three uh, and use 517, divide that by 30, because I want to have it at, you know, you want to shoot for a population of 30 to, for statistics. And I use the QGIS RAN function on the points and assigned values one through 17. Then I pulled out all the values that had one and 17 and saved those as checkpoints. So all the other points I used to do the satellite imagery processing, and I kept those back to do the calculations for accuracy. So when I got through there, I had the August one uh, came up with a root, screen root, root mean square error. Let's get the mouth working of 1.847 meters. The uh, December one was 1 1.6. So I decided to go ahead and go with the December primarily. But then for the areas where we're missing in the, in the December area, I did a, a inverse mask of the December data and pulled in the sections that, of the August data that would fill in those holes. I figured that might be more correct than trying to interpolate over those larger areas. Okay, so the next thing to do is go back and merge with the LIDAR because there's a lot of area that would be flooded at different levels that was covered by the LIDAR. So I, reprojected the data into uh, the uh, projection that had, had the LIDAR data and then converted it to a five foot resolution at the same time. As you see, a lot of the edges here are not covered by the bathymetry calculation from the satellite. So um, I, I went ahead and uh, with the points that I had, some of those were in that literal area and I used points that were missing to try to fill in some of the data. I just converted them to rasters in five foot resolution. And then I did an IDW interpolation to fill in the gaps from the sides and such. And it looks nice, but you've got to remember the, uh, this is the uncertainty measurement and you, you got high areas of uncertainty around a lot of these edges. You know, I'm not happy about that, but it's better than nothing. And, and I just can go with it. Um, so you just merge it all together at the five foot and export to GeoTIFF. Now, before I start doing the water level elevation, you've got to extract the topobathy, everything 135 and below. And then we're gonna resample it out to a 10 meter horizontal resolution to match the satellite imagery because you can't really get higher resolution than your source data. And then I run grass R lake at different elevations to get depth rasters. And then I'll combine the lake habitat with the stream habitat. One thing that I, I am looking forward to do uh, is to maybe think about doing time series analysis on this, because you could, in theory, do for every hour change of the lake, you could do a time series analysis of the depths. And this has been kind of fun and I'm, I've been addicted to it. So now I think I'm gonna take my kayak out with a survey tape and, and try some of the local lakes and see if I can replicate this a little bit better. It just sounds like fun. <laughs> so uh, improve to the process. I'm wondering if I did multiple scenes and did a reg regression analysis on it, if I could get a better fit to the bottom data. Um, higher spatial resolution, better temporal resolution would be great. I mean, planet data would probably with their newer super doves might be uh, suitable for doing this. And, I, and I'm hoping that that will um, uh, be something that I might have access to. The thing is that with the current Sen uh, Sentinel-2 data, everyone has access to that data. So anyone can replicate this if they want. And of course, having a higher depth accuracy on the checkpoints would be great. Um, and I'm 
you know, I, I, that's, that's on me. I, I, I possibly could have mentioned that to the biologists before they went out to collect stuff, but they were doing things to their specifications and um, it's going to work out fine. I'm not too worried about it. Okay. And now I'm, I uh, guess, questions and suggestions. Oh, I do want to do thanks to Peter Sturkey at the Dominion Energy and Corin Chamberlain, who were great in getting me the, the uh, EOPOT data. Department of Public Safety in North Carolina for having awesome LIDAR data. Um, Sentinel Project, which, well, Copernicus Project at ESA. And the GRASS and QGIS software projects, which made life much easier. All right. And then I guess questions. Do we have any questions, Jeff? Well, so far we do not. Um, so, oh. so <clears throat> we welcome your questions, have plenty of time. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I'm really, I, I like to see how you use different tools and all the different data. It, it, I love seeing how all of that comes together. Um, one thing I've wondered about is whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, have, are you primarily interested in the um, uh, depths throughout the lake or are you are you really interested in where the channel is or um do you have you know if you if you knew where the channel was that would be pretty helpful i think with your your work uh, and maybe interpolate some of the other outside the channel well the uh the, that's the thing with the eel pots is they're trying to determine what depths and what um eco ecological niches I see. The eels are using throughout the lake and at what times of the year, what the water temperature is, um, when do the eels shut down. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into that because that's more the province of the biologists working on the project. But uh, there were some surprises, so shall we say, with uh, where, when and where some of the eels were. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this data, uh, it, it's not going to say, it's not going to tell them a, a go, no go for where, where the eels are, but I think it will help them to describe the habitat in which they find the eels and when they find them. Well, one possible way to, uh, I, I was just thinking about if you to find the channel and also perhaps not, not highly accurate, but another way would be to find some old aerial photographs and do some uh, photo interpretation. Of course, you could, you could have just one image to get the, the channel location, but um, uh, you can go to Earth Explorer and get quite a few historic aerial photos and right. and maybe a, a way to uh, do some uh, uh, photo interpretation to, to ascertain elevations as well. We do have some uh, comments and questions that have come in now. So oh, good. Um, Sam Feldstein asked, what was the most interesting aspect of this project to you? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, it, when you see an end product that, that you know, you've got that, that depth gradient going from the deep water to the, thing, th to the shallow water and you say, it worked. <laughs> that was, that's what's fun. <laughs> but that, was, that, that came after that process of, oh, I have to dive into the, the uh, Python script that calls the R script and look at the specifics on the R script and see what the, you know, errors that may be popping up while you run it. What did those mean? Oh, okay. That took a, it took me about four or five hours to get through that and figure out what was going on and what needed to be fixed on that. Um, and it, uh, it was, it was gratifying to, to be able to get it to work after that point. And once I'd spent that time, I felt obligated at that point to do a very detailed bug report to the grass project and say, this is what's going on. And, you know, at this line, this line, this line, this is how I change this line to make it work. And when you do that, if you do a very detailed bug report, it makes it very easy for the people who are maintaining it uh, to, su to suggest a fix or someone else to suggest a fix. Or you can do it yourself. You just say, if you write the bug report right, then your fix is already suggested in there. Yeah, that's always kind of a special experience to hit a roadblock like that and, and wonder if it's a bug and, and you know, dig in and, and 
you know, obviously it takes a lot of time to go through and, uh, but yeah, like I say, very gratifying when you do <laughs> figure that out, that, that there is a bug and there's a, a way to fix it. So good work well, on that. And, and that's part of the whole open source thing is that mm -hmm. I was able to look in and see what was going on and to fix it myself and, and share that fix with others. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, instead of saying I get an error with, with a number on it, that's indecipherable. And what do you do then? All right. Uh, okay, a lot more has come in. So um, Holly Brackett asks, can you show the final merged image again? I oh, think you had that in one of your slides. Yeah, that was, uh, oh, sorry. That's, uh, that's a five foot topo bathy, um, just which, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the five foot version of the bathy is, is valid. <laughs> that's why I generalized it back out to 10 meters. But uh, that's the area that I was working in with uh, uh, the complete drainage that goes into the Roanoke Rapids Reservoir in before the dam upstream. Great. And the eels really use a lot of that. It's, it's, they're really adaptable creatures. It's interesting. Eels are very fascinating. I, this is totally off topic, but I read a book one time about, uh, I think of the title is Consider the Eel. And if anyone, <laughs> it was very fascinating to read. Um, we've got a copy here at NC State. Um, I don't know how, I'm sure it's on Amazon, but I can recommend that. Um, Catherine Kolb asked, what was the source of your LIDAR data that you used for the non-lake areas? Oh, that's the North Carolina, uh, I think it was phase one. Okay. Phase one or phase two uh, of 2014 data, state of North Carolina QL2. So the QL2, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it, and the, I use the same process uh, uh, that I described it a couple of days ago in the other presentation to do the, the whole landscape within that, um, at, that watershed. Uh, that way I was able to get some fairly uh, I can get flat water elevations for all of the water bodies instead of just the ones that have brake lines on them. Okay, Susan Gale asks, can you explain the rationale behind the GRASS R computations for converting RGB, NIR, SIR to depth or provide a reference if that's too complicated? Uh, there, if you, you could just Google for uh, GRASS GIS, um, I image bathymetry. And if you go to that website, that will give, uh, that's a, a, the manual page for the command. And it has references to at least two and possibly three uh, papers that that command is based on, which can, can show you, point you to why they used uh, the uh, geographically weighted regression on that. Okay. A couple more questions. Uh, could this type of analysis be applied to more dynamic systems such as rivers? I don't know. Um, the thing is you'd have to know the, uh, the river water stage, uh, the stage of the river at the time of the satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. And I would say you would also need to have some, some uh, depth measurements at that time as well. If you had a stretch of river that had a USGS gauge associated with it, and you went out on the day that the uh, the satellite went over and it was clear water, then you probably could do that. Um, remember, you are dealing with a 10 meter resolution footprint and it didn't like doing too much around the edges. So that would limit the, the size of the river that you could do to probably something fairly substantial. Okay, uh, very good. And Alice Wilson asks, have you compared existing Bathy data to what you've created? Uh, there really wasn't any existing Bathy data that I had available to me at the time. There may be more now with uh, some of the companies that sell the depth finders. I know some of them privately hold some of the data, but I haven't compared yet. Uh, the, the, uh, and you'd also have to know exactly the time that the, the bathymetry was taken. There's a, there's a whole lot of interesting stuff to go with that. I, would, I wouldn't mind, I think that would be an interesting thing is uh, uh, Jeff mentioned before that there was Jordan Lake has some, some topography from before the, when the lake was built. It might be worthwhile trying the same thing on Jordan Lake 
uh, and comparing it to the Corps of Engineers um, old contour lines. Is this lake used as a water supply for any um, municipality or what, I, what is the purpose of the lake? The uh, purpose of this power? lake is power generation. Right, okay. Yeah, the, the lake above it has much more water and is a flood control reservoir and they release uh, water down in the, the uh, they fill up the lake downstream and, and drain it out a couple of feet to generate power. Well, I know that um, lakes that are used for water supply, there's a lot of interest right now in trying to better calculate the water volume I, and uh, which of course requires bathymetry. So, you know, engineers get involved in that. Yeah, I think there is, a, I don't know if it's in this lake or the one upstream of it, that uh, the town of Virginia Beach had a, a water supply line, line run to it. Mm -hmm. so I remember that. I don't know if they did. They is. did. They did finish that. I, I remember there was a lot of controversy. I, uh, as far as I know, they were cleared to do it. I don't, I, I don't have many details, but that's as far as I know, the only possible mm -hmm. uh, water supply for that area. Okay. We, if anyone has any last questions, we've, got another minute or two, um, but we do have another session after this, the last series of sessions, and then we will have the uh, closing. Um, so uh, it's been a great conference as far as I'm concerned. And uh, yeah. certainly thank you, Doug, for this presentation. Very interesting. And, and um, I know you and I know you enjoy doing it and, and um, I enjoyed learning about it and um, appreciate everyone participating. Okay. Uh, so, so nothing else has come in. So 